Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming, especially with this very harsh weather. It looks like, you know, so I think I saw the agency last night and the weather is trying to not make me come to tell you how I saw the agency. Maybe not, but yeah, we'll see. Um, so first again, like, you know, these are pictures generated with stable diffusions. I love them. Uh, they're going to be the cover of my presentations like from here onwards, I think. Um, okay, so today is my attempt, oops, this was off. Uh, today is my attempt to bring some, uh, you know, final discussion points to our conversations this week about um, agency, agents, and related ideas. And to do so, I will try and focus on what I think are some very good examples of first principles attempts to define agency. What do I mean by first principles? I mean that they will be mathematical and I mean that they will be axiomatic. So they will give some initial assumptions, some initial axioms, and from there, they will try to derive a definition of agency. Um, they will be, uh, of course, you know, just a few examples of the possibly many available theories out there. They are, I guess, my favorite. I will try to be, I guess, as unbiased as possible uh, to just give you as many, I guess, references for you to check out on your own after this lecture, um, which means, you know, you might prefer like some, uh, say, assumptions, some axioms to other ones, and that's completely fine. Um, you know, I, of course, have my preference and maybe some of my bias will come out during this presentation, but I would like you to choose whichever one you prefer, whichever class of methods you prefer. Maybe you want to create a new class. That's also fine uh, without necessarily following what I'm saying. So um, I don't have, say, a huge amount of slides, but they are all pretty dense in information which means that there might be some things you might want to just stop me uh, and ask like, you know, along the way, and that's completely fine. Uh, I think I have enough time to go through like some quick questions and then we can have the full discussion afterwards. Um, if I have more time left than I initially imagined, I might try and show you say how I approach this kind of question. There will be something about some work in progress from me uh, anyway in the slides, but depending on how much time I have left, I might just you know, draw something on the iPad and show you how I try to go about this kind of question. Okay, so I will try and classify the examples that I'm bringing out today in three classes, prediction-based, causality-based, and relational. And we'll see like, you know, along the way what I mean by you know, these three classes and these three different names that I gave to the classes. Um, so another, I guess, important point is that some of these theories are not strictly speaking about agents. So some of these theories are not being presented as theories of agents they are, or agency. They are presented as theories of, for example, autonomy, perhaps adaptation, perhaps individuality. My claim is that even if they are presented as you know, a theory of individuality or a theory of autonomy, they have something to say about agency. Maybe that's not the initial, that was not the initial goal of some of these theories, but I think they anyway have something to say about agency. So we'll try to reinterpret them in terms of the questions we've been asking uh, you know, so far in this week. Um, also, I mean, hopefully you, know, you will see that um, a lot of these theories, I mean, I will try to tell you what I believe the strengths and the weaknesses are for all of these approaches. Um, the idea is that we probably don't have a full complete notion of agency yet, and that's fine. But I would like to praise the people that try to you know, come up with something, even if I don't like it, it's a good uh, way, I guess, to discuss why I don't like it and why we can do, it, we can do something better perhaps. Um, the number of weaknesses, number of strengths doesn't really matter. One particular theory, you know, might just list in my slides a single strength, and that strength might be the same, might have the same value 
as four different strengths for another theory. So if I only put one strength, one strength point, that doesn't mean that this theory is not very strong. It just means that I believe that that's perhaps really, really important. And that's enough to justify why it's on my slides. Yeah. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, I will try to reinterpret all of these approaches in terms of agents and agency. Um, so first, prediction-based methods. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, these are methods that try to interpret agency as a property given by an observer. So how predictable a system is tells you whether it is an agent or not. And we'll see more in detail what I mean by how predictable. There are different ways to quantify that. But the idea is that these are mainly in the eye of the observer. So the observer decides whether there is agency or not. Um, the main idea is that we are going to treat systems as if they are agents. So, and this will come out later again, but you know, the idea is that we are going to attribute a goal to the system and we're going to try and understand whether attributing a goal to a system is a useful description for the system. And if it is, then we are probably going to be inclined to call that an agent. Um, Nick mentioned Dennett's intentional stance yesterday, and that I would say is the main inspiration for this kind of approaches. Of course, the history, the literature uh, about this kind of ideas is much older, but I would say that Dennett encapsulates this very well. You can have a system just in front of you and you can decide whether it is an agent or not depending on uh, how predictable it is. Tools, information theory, filtering theory, based on inference, reinforcement learning, et cetera, et cetera. Some examples uh, that I will cover. The free energy principle, um, the information individual, and the behavioral compression method uh, by our soul. So free energy principle. Um, has anyone ever heard of the free energy principle before? Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, so the free energy principle started as a theory of uh, brain functioning, trying to tell us that brains are based on inference, inference machines, and that we can understand different functions in the brain as forms of Bayesian inference at different levels, at the neural level, at the network level, at the behavioral level. Uh, then it turned into, say, a theory of life, uh, at least with this paper starting in 2013, and then more recently in a theory of things. What they call things to me are agents because they want to say that these things can sense, can act, and can do a lot of other interesting things. So to me, those are agents. And that's why, you know, I'll tell you that this free energy principle is trying to give us a theory of agency. Um, the main construct that they use is this thing called Markov Blankets. I will give a talk at the chain seminars about this next week. If you can see something, I hope you can all see like the colors on these figures. The Markov Blanket is supposed to be like a boundary between an agent and the environment. This is a statistical boundary uh, and it can change over time and it has a lot of say interesting properties but more or less, you know, it is a statistical description of a system. So can we say that the system is statistically, uh, well, it is, can we say that a system is conditionally independent on its environment given this mark on blanket, given this boundary? Uh, I mentioned in this paper, 2013, this paper has a lot of problems. Uh, there is a paper actually from two years ago that actually describes what problems there are in there. But the theory has been updated over time, so I think it's still interesting. Um, the main message of the free energy principle is that an agent is a system that performs approximate Bayesian inference on its environment. So it takes some observations from the environment and tries to update its beliefs about the hidden states of the environment. This is what it means for an agent to be an agent, according to the free energy principle. Yeah, uh, I didn't put names in there, but yeah, you should imagine observations on one side, environment to agent, 
and actions agent to environment. Yeah. Um, don't think too much about, I guess, the robot in there, the world in here. They are just some, you know, caricatures, some simple images that should evoke the idea that there is an agent and then there is something that is not the agent. Um, okay, what are the strengths of the free energy principle? I believe that it's probably the main strength of this, uh, of this framework lies in the fact that it connects to a lot of existing fields from biology, neuroscience, cognitive science, philosophy of mind, physics, reinforcement learning, control theory. Some people are trying to be robots with this. That was the goal of my PhD, but I never actually managed. The idea is that the mathematical, um, say, framework behind it is powerful enough and, say, flexible enough to connect to a lot of interesting ideas from different fields. Um, I will not be presenting any equations because that would probably take the whole one hour just for those. Um, one, of, one very interesting, uh, I guess, um, point in my opinion is that this allows for agency to be defined at multiple levels. So the bacteria in my stomach could be agents. I can be an agent. Our group could be an agent. Perhaps our society could be an agent. Um, to go back to some ideas that came out yesterday, uh, the free energy principle in particular makes an assumption that uh, agency is scale free, so that we're going to be able to describe agency across all of these different levels using the same exact mathematical framework, the same exact model. Again, it's up to you whether you buy that or not. You might say, well, it's a bit different, or maybe I don't like agency across scales. I'm just trying to give you options to choose from. What are some of the limitations? Well, it is technically limited only to stationary processes, which makes it very much not interesting for biological systems. It doesn't do a lot of the interesting, it doesn't cover a lot of the interesting things that happen in biology uh, from you know, reproduction to evolution to growth. Uh, a lot of interesting things that happen in biology are just not covered by this yet. Um, the second point is something I will be mentioning and you know, drilling down um, in my talk next week. The ontological commitments of this framework are very strong for, in my opinion, a very weak you know, notion of separation between agent and environment. It's purely statistical. Um, it's just in the eyes of the observer, but they actually say that they can go and find agents in the environment in arbitrary conditions. And I'm saying that that's not true. And I have, I think, enough evidence to show that that's not true. Um, another thing that came out yesterday, uh, because of this scale-free property, uh, the free energy principle goes all the way up, all the way down. Quantum systems are interpreted as agents, if you buy the idea of the free energy principle. The universe as a whole, well, maybe not the universe as a whole because there's no environment, but say a galaxy could be an agent. And with the free energy principle for now, we have to live with that. Um, strength, strengths and weaknesses, you choose uh, whichever, I guess, theory you like more. Information individual. Um, so this is an amazing theory. Uh, it's been out like for probably 13 years now, but it's only been published two years ago. It was um, a preprint that I used quite heavily for a project um, in two, well, 2017, 18, uh, about trying to understand whether the systems that I was showing you in reaction diffusion models could be inter interpreted as agents. Um, the idea here is that we have um, so the thing at the top is a Bayesian network. Um, we have, um, so each letter basically represents a node. And then we have arrows. We have connections between these nodes. And we are saying that E, the environment, is evolving left to right. And then we have a system evolving left to right. We have that the system gives some input to the environment and the other way around. We also have that the system and the environment independently have their own dynamics. And altogether, this makes, uh, this makes up the system we are examining. Um, the idea here is to study how much of the future of the system 
is determined by either the environment or the past of the system or a combination of the two. We have different ways to look at this. Here I just report, I, I know that I said no equations, but this I think is pretty uh, straightforward in a sense that you know, with a single equation, I can tell you a lot. Uh, we have say, we are trying to understand how the future of a system Sn plus one is determined by the past of the system Sn or um, the past of the environment En. We can decompose this quantity and mutual information uh, in different ways. Uh, the first one I think is the one that tells us more, the first quantity, uh, the mutual information between the past and the future of a system. Here, we're just looking at Markov systems. So we're just looking one state away, but in general, this could be the entire history of a system. This is something called predictive information and comes also under, I think five different names has been rediscovered by at least five different papers in the last 20, 30 years. It's just trying to tell you how much a system is able to predict itself without input from the environment. The other quantity instead tell us, um, you know, how much the environment can tell us then the past of the system cannot already tell us. So it's a transfer entropy uh, quantity. Um, I like this theory. I think this is amazing. They presented that as a theory of individuality initially, but to me, the partition environment system makes it a strong candidate to consider if we want to cover possible theories of agency. There is another decomposition. I think the interpretation that they give to that uh, is not as strong as in the first one. So I just leave it there. You can check it out by yourselves whether and decide for yourselves if you like it or not. Um, here, the idea is that an agent is a system that is good at predicting itself. Now, this you know may sound just like a slogan, but that's the idea. I would like you to remember at least like a very, you know, basic intuition of what is going on. Um, strengths, well, this I think is a pretty good theory in a sense that we don't need to consider any particular physical uh, substrate for this system. So this could work for simulations, this could work for physical systems, this could work for anything, as long as we can define some notion of information. Um, and this I think is also pretty good because they are also considering um, agency across multiple levels. They have a definition of collective agency. They have a definition of individual agency. And this could be applied say to uh, many different levels. Um, I think this is also interesting because they don't necessarily tell us that there needs to be some sort of you know, membrane boundary between systems and agents. We're just saying that there are that there are two systems and they are interacting. There is no third system in the middle, a third boundary. Whether you think this is useful, this is useful or not, again, it's up to you. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm just reporting uh, a, different, um, a different basic network from a different paper because, I mean, this information in the informational individual actually still comes with some limitations in my opinion. Um, well, for one, they don't really tell us how to partition a general system into say an agent and an environment. They just assume that they are there already. And as far as I remember, they don't really cover how to partition an arbitrary system in agent plus environment. The most glaring, uh, I think, limitation is that there is no action in this framework. Uh, the, picture that, I'm, uh, that I have here that comes from a different paper is basically the same type of system, but this time considering actions. So these people, um, Tishby and Polanyi, they don't really try to give a theory of agency. That's why I didn't include them in this presentation, but their setup, I think is more agent-like because at least they try to tell us what actions are. The information on individual really does not do that. It only works for discrete systems. This is not a huge problem, perhaps, 
but for people especially doing uh, physics, this might be slightly unsatisfying, so I'm just leaving it there. I don't think this is a huge problem. It might be somewhat of a problem if we want to consider information theory for continuous variables because they, the quantities there are not as well defined. So far, so good? Yeah? Okay. Um, next one. Here, um, so this is an extremely, um, I think, underappreciated paper. And part of the reasons is that this paper is very dense. Like there is a lot of information in a very short text and it's really hard to extrapolate what these people are trying to do. Um, but it's anyway something that I would like to, to bring out at least at a very high level. Uh, also, and uh, maybe, I mean, also is still a deep mind, uh, leg, maybe still a deep mind, and Simon McGregor, former, uh, I mean, still member of uh, uh, Sussex University, where I studied and where I met uh, Suzuki Sam. Um, I would say that um, this paper and this method, which I just summarized as behavioral compression, is perhaps the best way we have at the moment to formalize the intentional stance, like the purest form of the intentional stance. Um, these people will basically take a system and make the system like solve some particular problem using some kind of algorithm. In this case, it's a small maze. The triangle, the yellow triangle, is our potential agent. The potential agent starts from uh, the left top uh, quadrant of this maze, and then it needs to go towards one of the circles. And you know, different problems, different strategies. And what we are trying to understand is whether different strategies and different goals affect our perception of agency in this system. So if I just, if I just show you the trajectory, the red thing, uh, sorry, not red, the bl uh, black line in this maze, or if I show you a video of this agent trying to get towards a goal, I mean, are you assuming that that's an agent? When will you say that that thing is an agent? When will you say it is not an agent? So this is, I think, the purest form of the intentional stance. Understand when this thing should be interpreted as an agent or not. Um, what they give is, say, a, uh, a way to try and do that. And uh, basically, they try to create two different strategies to interpret the trajectory of, um, of this system, of the triangle. And one strategy is um, basically trying to build a reinforcement learning explanation for what the, for what the system is doing. So we are going to try and find the best goal according to some uh, assumptions that this agent uh, could be following. And we are going to do that following uh, the idea of inverse reinforcement learning. So instead of finding a policy given a goal, we had the trajectory and now we are trying to understand the best goal given this trajectory. Then we are going to look instead at how we can predict the trajectory itself without having a goal. Now, the difference here uh, is something that they bring out in terms of uh, simple examples like a stone, a thermostat, and a game playing computer. Now, if you throw a stone, yeah, I mean, you can come up. We, you know, we had discussions about balls having goals. Yeah, you could say, yeah, the stone is trying to fall to the ground after that I throw it. But that adds very little to just a description in terms of Newtonian mechanics. Yeah, I mean, you could come up with some, you know, Lagrangian and trying to tell me, oh, yeah, this follows Hamilton's principle of least action. This thing is being minimized. Absolutely correct. But that explanation doesn't really add much. It is easy enough for me to just write down Newton's equations. Yeah, this thing will end up there. On the other hand, 
they say a thermostat has a, two different interpretations that perhaps are equally explanatory. So now we are, well, here is not working, but say in a normal room, we are trying to regulate the temperature. And we could say one, well, when the temperature is too low, go up. When the temperature is too high, go down. No particular goal. We're just trying to give a heuristic of explanation of the thermostat. Another explanation is to say, well, the thermostat is trying to regulate the temperature towards the goal that we are setting for this room. And they are saying, in this case, intuitively, we might have that both explanations are good explanations. The second one feels more agent-like than the first. For a game playing computer, of course, you know, deep mind people, it was very hot for them. Like, you know, I have my reinforcement learning algorithm that can beat humans in Atari games and now in much more incredible games. Well, I mean, I can try and explain to you what the neural network is doing underneath with all of these neurons sending signals to each other, but that doesn't really easily tell us what this system is doing, which is just, well, trying to beat humans, for example, or trying to beat the best score at this game. So in their claim, you know, we have these three different situations and we need to, you know, try and quantify those. So they set up an incredibly, I think, um, I want to say like complicated framework to do this. And I think it's really interesting. So I would recommend to at least try and check it out. And then what they do is compare whether, you know, having a goal that tell us that tries to describe the long-term behavior of the system or just predictions of, you know, one step uh, predictions of the trajectory without a goal is a better explanation. I was trying to find out which one is a better explanation. Um, so why is it called behavioral compression? Well, I'm saying compression because basically to predict the trajectory of, um, of the system, especially without a goal, they use algorithmic probability, uh, which is a way, um, which is a framework to, uh, that allows us to compress signals and basically trying to understand when different, um, say, pasts of a particular trajectory lead to the same future. Um, so their intuition here is what well, goals can help us, um, you know, predict the behavior of a system. If that is true, that system is an agent. By the way, how, how much time I have until what time? Oh, uh, yeah. wow, it's amazing. Um, okay, strengths of this approach. I would say the main strength is the fact that it is trying to formalize the intentional stance. You might say, well, I think it's missing some bits. Maybe it's not exactly doing the formalization that we would really like for the intentional stance. And I would say you're probably right, but I really, I'm a really huge fan of trying to formalize this approach. You might also say, I don't like the intentional stance. I don't think it's a good approach to try and understand agency. And you would be you know, just fine with that. Maybe you just don't need to look at this approach, but I think it is anyway interesting for the fact that it tries to go from a fairly abstract, but you know, intuitive idea to a mathematical framework where we can measure, we can try and measure this. It is also, I think, flexible enough to allow us to look for different goals and slightly different measures of predictability with or without goals. Perhaps the reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning could be done with different goals in mind. Um, that's absolute, well, not different goals, different ways to set up goals in mind. So I would say that even if we don't buy exactly the implementation that they have, we can still be interested in considering how we can go about comparing goals with or without goals. Um, some limitations. Um, so the idea, I guess, of the predictability 
of trajectories, especially with our goals, is that we can uh, compress different trajectories, different, say, uh, chunks of trajectories into a single trajectory and then do the prediction based, say, on this compressed version. Now, um, this is a very good way to do predictions, uh, say, with this algorithmic um, probability framework. Uh, an obvious, say, limitation of this is that if I have a system, a candidate system, a candidate agent that has very simple behaviors, say, it can only go this way or this other way. So I'm not like in a maze where you could go around in circles and then you know move a little bit or say move and then come back or do a lot of crazy things in a maze. If the behaviors are too simple, there is no compression happening because there's nothing to be compressed. And the measures that these people are using are a bit, say, are probably failing. They are not going to tell us much about the trajectory of a system if it can't be compressed. And maybe the system is still something we want to call an agent, maybe a very simple agent, but they will not be able to capture that or to tell us that with convincing evidence. A very important uh, question, um, you know, this is something that I think Katsunori has been very uh, strong about and I think for very good reasons. This just interprets, remember what I had in the first slide, this is just interprets agents, well, this just interprets systems as if they were agents. So I'm looking at a system in front of me and I'm deciding whether it is an agent or not. And if I say it is, I'm just saying, well, it looks like an agent but I don't have a criterion, strong criterion to tell you this really is an agent. Um, you might be fine with that, or you might want to consider whether that is something you should pay attention to. Um, the fact that they only tested a couple of, well, effectively only a couple of different measures in this paper, uh, you know, I mentioned the flexibility is good. We might want to use slightly different uh, say ways to build goals, slightly different ways to build predictions, but the fact that they didn't compare too many different ways to do so in the paper makes me a slightly, you know, uh, curious about whether these results would be uh, robust with different measures. So I don't know if what they found is just a very specific special case that works for the particular system they have, or if they have a more general rule to perhaps try and find agents. Okay, so these three examples, what can we gather uh, all together? Again, like, you know, there are many more, but, you know, let's try and get some, um, you know, some, in, uh, you know, intermediate conclusions about this prediction-based methods. Um, they are good because they take into account that observers might have, might play a role when it comes to defining agency and when it comes to defining agents. Um, in general, they're pretty good also because they don't need to make too many assumptions about the underlying system. We can probably do this with, you know, um, an oil droplet, we can try and do this with a reaction diffusion system. We can try and do this with a car, self-driving car. And as long as we have a notion of information, then we can try and build a theory in this class of methods. Um, it is also, and in my opinion, this is probably the main strength, a way to look at agency at different levels. Uh, you might then want to pick only one, but the fact that we can look at age, potentially at agency at different levels, at a multiple scales, spatial temporal scales, to me is a very strong point. There is enough flexibility there. Now, some of the disadvantages. Well, these methods are entirely observer dependent. So if you want to say that there is something also in the system you're looking at, well, these methods are probably not the answer for you. 
I'm saying that it is fine as long as we have a measure of information, but the fact that we have perhaps way too many measures of information might be a problem because, well, we never know which one is the right one. Maybe we pick one, we get one kind of answer. We pick a different uh, notion of information, we get a different answer. So sometimes something is an agent, sometimes it's not, just depending on which kind of information measure we pick. And that's not ideal. If we want an agency to depend on the observers, probably we don't at least want uh, agency to depend also on the measure that we pick as observers in a particular situation. Um, and as I mentioned, it doesn't really distinguish between true agency and as if agency. You might be fine with that, but yeah, it is something to be very careful um, about. Okay, causality based. Um, agency is a property that is intrinsic to a system. I would say this is the main mantra for this class of methods. Um, the main idea is that actions are causal. So to study actions and to study agency then, we need to study causality. Um, I'm bringing out as an inspiration David's own causalism. Uh, I'm leaving a link um, to um, you know, a very short overview of what this means. But yeah, I guess that the main idea is that mental states cause actions in the world. So we need to understand this causal chain. I also put per causality there because I consider that um, probably the standard, the best way to study causality um, in, a, um, in a mathematical sense. Some tools do calculus by per information theory and Bayesian networks to some extent, but causality, I think, needs to be the main thing in there. Some examples, integrated information theory, semantic information, and mechanized causal graphs that I will try and cover um, from now on. Has anyone ever heard of integrated information theory? Yeah. Okay, so integrated information theory is a theory originally developed in uh, neuroscience for the study of consciousness. So the researchers behind this theory propose a mathematical measure um, that they say captures exactly what it means to have consciousness. So they say the value that this function, that this you know, equation will give you is how much consciousness you have. And then they say humans have more consciousness than you know, laptops, but laptops also have a very perhaps little bit of consciousness. Rocks, probably nothing. That's more or less the idea. It's quite a long um, project. I think it's been going on uh, at least in its current form for almost 20 years. If we consider like some of the previous in work by some of the, of the same researchers, probably almost 30. But you know, I think it has some, um, some interesting things to say about consciousness. And you know, some people don't like the fact that it's too, um, I say too direct, and they try to say, oh, this number is consciousness, because there are a lot of assumptions that are a bit, at least dubious, that are a bit unclear. Uh, but, you know, I think it is doing some interesting work, potentially. For us, it's interesting because some of these researchers have tried to use the same theory to find or to describe agency and agents. In particular, I'm referring to Alban Takis, who's been doing, uh, who has at least two or three papers on defining agents. Um, without, again, like, you know, going into equations here, the main idea of IIT is that we can, um, and I'm saying IIT is integrated information theory. It's too long to say all the time. IIT tell us that uh, we can quantify the intrinsic irreducibility of a system. What is that? intrinsic irreducibility is the cause effect power that a system has at a certain scale that cannot be described by the components below that particular scale. 
So this is a possible notion of emergence. We talked about emergence before. This is one possible explanation uh, for emergence. Again, some people don't like it, but you know, I think it is an interesting measure anyway. Um, the idea then is that we are going to look at a system at different scales, and we're going to look at um, intrinsic irreducibility at different scales, and we are going to pick the scale with the highest intrinsic irreducibility, and we're going to say, this is the agent, only at this particular scale, yeah? Here's an example, uh, you know, here we have like some neural networks and then we have some gray boxes. These are meant to represent two different scales, one where we see the neurons and one where we don't. So here the idea is that agents are emergent uh, and they cannot be explained in terms of their constitutive parts. So something that was asked before is whether you know agency is an emergent property. These people say so. So if you think that that's a good way to think about agency, I would invite you to look into this. Some of the strengths. Um, this formalizes the idea of uh, looking at agency at different scales, importantly. Agency only exists at one scale, they, at one scale, they say, but we can start analyzing whether agency exists, could exist, say, at one particular scale. And to do that, we need to consider many different scales. Um, it has a way to formalize um, emergence versus, say, like reductionist explanations. And with that, we try to formalize, say, agency. Agency is emergent because it cannot be explained by reductionist approaches. And it focuses on causality. So this intrinsic uh, irreducibility is measured through a, um, say, through a causal framework. So instead of using standard probabilities, they have um, what is called uh, an intervention-based probability which is the framework that I described, uh, that I mentioned by Pearl, and that I believe is probably the strongest candidate we have for a theory of causality, a mathematical theory of causality. Um, some limitations, as usual, um, agency is only at a single scale. If you believe that agency can exist at multiple scales at the same time, this is not probably a good theory for you. IIT as a framework comes with a lot of questions. This theory has been, uh, as I said, like, you know, now it's been discussed for around 20 years. Uh, we are now at version four that came out last month. Um, there are a lot of changes every time. There are a lot of assumptions that many people don't like. For example, I don't like this, you know, uh, the fact that you had to choose a particular scale uh, the measure doesn't say anything about that. They are just including that as an assumption. Um, other people have other issues. You know, this is not, uh, you know, this is doing some work, but every time we think this is doing good work, then some people find counterexamples. And yeah, it's work in progress. I think that's the best way to put it. It's not yet a uh, finalized theory. Again, it's only for discrete systems. This is a minor thing. It's not the end of the world, but I think it is worth mentioning. Again, like, you know, for the physicists, this might be a bit uh, of a hairy point. So far, so good. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Semantic information. Uh, this is a different approach by Kolchinsky, who probably will no it's not here already it will be here in chain like next week uh giving a talk uh not about this stuff about some uh, some other work that is doing in information geometry um but i think this is um you know a good paper about you know potentially defining agency again using causality the difference here is that well for one, he's using a very different notion of, well, a different notion of causality. So it's not really using this uh, per causality. 
is using like a process that it calls like scrambling of information that comes from, um, you know, there are some references in the paper, you can check that out. It is not very clear to me how that exactly works, but you know, it is a possible notion of causality. Um, the important thing here is that we have um, a connection, not only to probability distributions, like in the earlier IIT, uh, so the difference between causal and non-causal uh, representations of random variables. Here we have notions of information that are causal or not causal. So what do I mean by that? In, I mean that there are at least a couple of quantities defined in this paper, this stored semantic information, this observed semantic information that are strictly and very closely related to well-known quantities we have in information theory, mutual information and transfer entropy. If you remember, I mentioned this too for the informational individual, mutual information tell us how much two systems you know, are correlated and transfer entropy tell us how much the past of one system can tell us more about another system than the past of the second system itself. These are purely correlational in information theory, but these guys actually managed to come up with a causal version of these two measures. So basically we are looking at something like the informational individual I was describing earlier, from a causal perspective, a possible causal perspective. So instead of just measuring, um, say, these particular quantities for an observer, um, now we are measuring potentially what it means for these, um, say, two quantities to, to be useful or not, say, from the perspective of uh, the potential agent. What do I mean to be useful? Well, we need to set a goal for the system. And these guys, they set the goal that the system wants to survive. And then we're going to measure these two, um, uh, say, quantities there based on the goal that the system wants to survive. Yeah. Once again, like the short version, agents are systems with a high degree of stored semantic information and observed semantic information. So they are very good at predicting themselves causally and they are good at using information from the environment to predict themselves causally. Um, the advantages is that, well, while they use a particular goal, survival, we can swap in a different goal and use the same quantities now defined for a different goal. That will give different answers, but I think it gives flexibility to explain, I don't know. Um, the first example that came to mind is whether this theory can explain why uh, I think it is bumblebees or a species of bees that actually uh, kill themselves for the sake of the hive sometimes. If there are predators or something, they will kill themselves in order to sting the predator and try to save the hive. That's the high level explanation. This system is not trying to survive. Does it mean that it's not an agent? So these are questions that I think have some value and the fact that we can change the goal makes this still relevant. Um, I think it is also you know, another way to really consider the difference between correlation and causation. For the observer, we can only from say the observer perspective, we can only say whether a system um, is actually you know, um, showing correlation. But if we want to say something about causality, we, look, we need to try and look from the perspective of the system itself, which is something that these people are trying to do. Uh, limitations, once again, uh, well, sure, I mean, we don't have a specific goal that gives us flexibility, but once again, we don't know which goal is right. Maybe we don't want a single goal for every possible you know, definition of agent, but if we want to find a definition of agency, perhaps we need to settle on one specific goal. And this 
framework does not tell us which goal it should be. If you think we can have like a plurality of goals, it's fine. If you think there should be only one goal, yeah, maybe not that great. And usually it is assuming we know the agent already. Again, it doesn't tell us where to do the cut. Uh, if we think that agent is something that is not the environment, then we need to cut a system and say, this is the environment, this is the agent. Again, if we want that. And this framework does not tell us how to do it. They have some suggestions, but it's not the central goal, I would say. Last for um, causal methods. Um, again, only some examples. This is very recent work by DeepMind. Uh, does everyone know what DeepMind is? Has everyone, anyone ever heard of DeepMind? Yeah, so DeepMind is an artificial intelligence startup. Well, now I think it's not a startup anymore. Uh, it got bought by Google in 2014. It was the one that actually ended up on nature multiple times for their incredible reinforcement learning um, methods to solve Atari games, to solve other very complicated, Go, uh, the game of Go, that uh, was also thought to be impossible, uh, say, to um, solve. And when I mean solve, I mean, like, you know, achieve human level, um, say, ability. So they are an incredible uh, company. Now they are part of, say, Alphabet, like the, the, co the company that controls Google. Uh, amazing work in general. Uh, one thing that I had to say I didn't like about this paper is that they claim they are the first people to ever define a framework about agency that involves causality. And I think it is clearly false. I can find at least four different frameworks that tried to do that before. Otherwise, great work. Um, so these people, uh, they bring out an example where they say, okay, I have a mouse in this very simple world. The mouse wants the cheese and the mouse can move to a different cell in this very simple world. It can move left or it can move right. Now, I'm going to say that this is a probabilistic world where there are going to be two parameters. First parameter, when the mouse moves, well, the pavement is a bit slippery. So sometimes even if it wants to go right, it could end up being left. So there is a non-zero probability. There is one parameter that basically tells me how probable it is that if I want to go right, I really go right. Then there is a second parameter which tells us whether the cheese will actually be where I think the cheese is. So it might be that, you know, my eyesight is not great. And sometimes, you know, I'm not really sure. Yeah, maybe there is cheese there. Maybe there is not. There is also probability that if I end up where I think the cheese is, maybe the cheese is not there. Maybe I was wrong. Yeah, so two parameters. These people say, um, well, it is quite easy to say, like in standard frameworks to say, there is a decision D. So I will decide as a mouse if I want to go left or right. I will end up in this new cell, X. It could be the right cell or the left cell, depending on, say, how slippery the pavement was. And then there will be a utility there, whether there is cheese or no. Yeah? They say, well, agents are systems that can change the way that they decide about say, um, you know, in this case, the mouse like changing position, they can change the decision-making processes based on how much information they have about these parameters in the environment, how slippery the pavement is and how bad my eyesight is. So in this case, we have parameters uh, that use this tilde here that are basically going in the opposite direction. And these parameters are the ones that tell us how we should change the way we decide to move. I think this is a really interesting approach. Uh, it adds like some complexity on standard models, but I think it is a very good uh, and natural perhaps intuition about what agency could be. Um, right, so this is a quote from their paper. I just took it as it is because I think it is very 
a very good summary of what they are trying to do. Agents are systems that would adapt their policy, so their decisions, if their actions influence the world in a different way. So if a system knew that the actions that it's about to take will have a different, say, effect on the world, then the one you know they, they thought before, and if they change the way their decision is made after having this information, this changing this, the, their decision-making processes is the factor that tell us that we are dealing with an agent. If they cannot change, they are not agents. That's their idea. So the strengths of this, um, of this method are, in my opinion, for one, we have, a, I think, probably the best implementation of so far of per causality, uh, something that I was mentioning earlier to me, and I think to many people is probably the best uh, available framework we have to try and explain causality. Um, something better might come out in the future, but for now, this is probably the best we have. And this framework captures, I think, very precisely how agents should look like based on this framework. And um, they have also a very nice discussion in the paper where they mention what exactly counts as an agent, where we should say place a boundary between agent and environment. And this brings out an example we discussed again this week. So that's why I'm bringing this out now about uh, whether, for example, reinforcement learning systems are agents or not. And they're saying, well, if I only consider a trained reinforcement learning system, that thing is probably not an agent according to this uh, definition because it's not going to change the way it acts if I give it more information. But if I can retrain the system after giving more information to the reinforcement learning agent, so the retraining, the training itself included in the reinforcement learning agent makes it an agent according to them. Yeah, so without training, not an agent, with training, an agent. And I think this is a very interesting point that they make. Some limitations, uh, the variables. So this is an example they have in the paper, like, you know, it's similar to the DXU that I had in the previous slides. Uh, this, I think, is for some, yeah, simple like decision making mechanism, say like an ATM machine, where you press a button, something comes out, or whatever. Um, all of these variables, they need to be decided a priori. So they claim that, you know, we can learn the structure of a particular system with enough data, but you basically need to say how many variables you want from uh, the system to begin with. So you need to have a very good idea of what is going on already. Maybe you don't exactly know which one is causing which, but you need to know how many variables you have. They give some advice on how to find them, but yeah, it's you know, a pretty strong assumption. Um, their approach is based on per causality, so on interventions. These are basically um, ways in which we can augment standard probability theory by looking at, say, how different random variables affect each other. And the idea of interventions is that we, if we can cut all of the possible, um, say, connections that we have between, uh, which direction is it now? Between all variables to the variable I'm interested in except one, and then I can test whether this variable actually changes the one I'm interested in, then that thing is uh, causality. Now, this is cool when we can play, say, with a system, if we can run some simulations on a computer because we can run many simulations where I remove a connection, I add a connection, I remove two connections, I remove three. But in the real world, you know, it is not that easy to say, yeah, I want to stop gravity for a second, and I want to check if this is really the cause of, no, we cannot really do that. Um, 
of course, these people have thought about this for a very long time. So they have something called soft interventions where they say, well, you just need to look at a system many, many times and hope that you will see all of these different possibilities. And that is also almost like having a real intervention. Now, this is, of course, an approximation and, you know, it doesn't always work and you need a lot, a lot of data. And I'm not really sure if this is something that we want from a definition of agents. Maybe it is. Maybe you need a lot of practice. Maybe you don't. So maybe this is not a good definition. Okay, all in all, uh, causality-based methods. Um, they take into account the intrinsic um, notion of agency. They consider per-causality in some cases, which I think is a great strength. And in general, they are observer independent, or they try to be. Um, do we really want to say that action is about causality? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. I think there are many ways in which we could consider actions that are not really causal, but you know they anyway define agents, perhaps. Um, causal models are in the end still subjective. They are never really truly objective. Uh, at least like in uh, Perl, um, in Perl's reading of causality, we still need to write down which variables we are interested in and we need to say how these variables map to the real world. Um, so are they really observer independent if we need to anyway, uh, you know, subjectively assign causal structure to the model? I don't know. Okay, last class. Uh, I left, you know, I, I'm probably going to spend less time on this because I think this is very fresh material. So there is something in this area, but yeah, probably not as well developed as the previous two. Um, relational methods. Agency is something with uh, agency with respect to something. So agency only exists as a property, as a relational property with something else. That would be saying my slogan for that. Um, oh, I forgot to uh, end this sentence. Okay, I will. Yeah, I will correct the slides before I upload them. Uh, agency is in the way systems, you know, relate to each other. Um, some inspirations: cybernetics, and once again, Randall Beer. Uh, I think this person has done such a tremendous amount of work in different areas. It is incredible how often. Uh, his work has come out in this week alone. Um, some tools, dynamical systems theory, systems theory, uh, category theory. Uh, some examples, um, the first framework by, is by Randa Beer. The second framework by Beer, who I mentioned at least in the first talk for his thesis on formal definitions of agency. The last one is by me, it's still work in progress. We'll see how much we can cover. <clears throat> So dynamical systems for agent environment interactions. This figure comes from uh, one of Randa Bia's works. The idea is that I'm going to give you three dynamical systems. I'm going to connect them. And then in some cases, these three dynamical systems will look like an environment and an agent that is formed of a body and a nervous system. Something very important here to say, Beer brings out the idea of nervous systems as an analogy, but honestly, we can consider this framework for bacteria and say the nervous systems are some chemical networks. Doesn't have to be neurons. I think it is a good analogy because it is easy to think about it, but it, it can be generalized. It is easy to generalize. So don't worry too much about brains being in there. Um, the key feature here uh, comes in uh, the first paper by Beer. The key feature is this definition of adaptive fit. Uh, he says an animal is, it quickly generalizes that to you know, artificial systems, agents in general, but this quote was just too nice not to bring up. Um, an agent is adaptively fit to an environment only so long as it maintains its trajectory within this constrained volume, something he mentions earlier as the agent's existence in, within a state space. 
despite the perturbations that it receives from the environment. So if, he, if an agent receives perturbations from the environment, to some extent, you know, adapt to these perturbations, we cannot adapt to everything, then this system is an agent. I think this is extremely simple. And because of how simple it is, I think this is really powerful. So the message here is that um, agents are systems that adaptively fit their environment. So we can only define agents if we look at how a system interacts with its environment. There's no other way. You might say, well, you know, this doesn't really tell me. Well, that's the point. Here, agency is in the relation. It is not really looking inside the agent. It's just saying, well, we need to see how this agent interacts with an environment and, you know, how many perturbations it can survive, et cetera. If you remember when I mentioned the cognitive domain of the glider and how gliders are robust to certain perturbations, a really small amount, this work comes out of this kind of definition. The cognitive domain analysis of the glider is based on this definition. Um, some advantages. Well, I guess, you know, as I mentioned, there are very few assumptions, and I think this is amazing. This is great. Um, and the environment finally plays a role. It is not just about the agent, the agent for an observer or the agent for itself. Surely, I mean, we have something about the environment helping predicting the agent, but it was just the environment is out there. It is not really doing much if not giving us information. Some limitations. Well, um, this adaptive fit idea is not really formally, you know, presented in Randa Bia's work. Like there is a nice, um, you know, paragraph on that, but there's no mathematical way uh, I can see that happening. Um, maybe there are systems that are not agents and that are still showing adaptive fit. And that is also not well clarified. Agents are kind of assumed in a way, because again, we are not really trying to find the cut. If I give you a system, where is the agent? Where is the environment? And I'm saying that, you know, with a question mark, because maybe that is the whole point. The fact that we are, do not need to have such a strong cut. Um, second approach, uh, Bayesian interpretation map, um, Martin Beale, Nathaniel Virgo, Simon McGregor. The idea here, I think, is relatively uh, simple. The maths, not necessarily. Um, we're going to take a dynamical system. Um, so we have a system that evolves over time. What we need to do is build something that they call an interpretation map which maps the states of the dynamical system to some probabilities. People also call them beliefs, but they don't necessarily have to have a very strong meaning of belief. They are just probability distributions. Now, in this probability distribution space, we're gonna come up with a model that might be actually either a good model of the environment or just any model. And we're gonna do Bayesian inference on this model using the probabilities that we got from the interpretation map. Now we have two systems. We have one that lives in probability space and we have the real dynamical system. We're gonna run them in parallel and we're gonna check at each point in time whether the interpretation map works. So can I interpret each point in time of the dynamical system as part of a Bayesian process, uh, of a Bayesian inference process? If the answer is yes, they say this is an agent. So this is quite similar in a sense, if you remember to the free energy principle, but in a way they don't try to connect it to the physics of the problem. Uh, say, well, you know, now we have some particles here, they are the environment. These people, they're just happy to say, if I have a model and this model could be about the environment or could be about anything. As long as I can do Bayesian inference on that model and I can use that to describe the dynamical system itself, that's an agent. Okay, sounds, sounds great. I mean, it is very, oh, 
Uh, I'm gonna show you limitations already. I forgot the animation here. Um, it is very good, like, you know, it is, um, it has very few assumptions. It is very general. It works in category theory, which is this very abstract uh, part of mathematics where we can do things, um, you know, with relatively few assumptions. Um, it doesn't need a good model of the environment as long as it is a model and as long as this consistency that I described works, then we have an agent. Uh, if you want to say that a model needs to be it about the real environment, then maybe this is not a good definition for you. So the relation in this case is not between an agent and the environment, is between an agent and this arbitrary model. If you like that, good. If you want the real environment, maybe not so good. Um, also, I had to say that by discussing with them, I'm not sure that this definition captures only agents. This probably works for thermostats and a lot of other systems that, I don't know, maybe you want to call an agent, but if you don't want to call an agent, you should be careful about. Cool. Last slide, I mean, not last slide, let's say last method. So this is the thing I'm working on. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, so I'm not going to go too much in detail, but let's say this basically puts together uh, part of the things I just told you about this consistency map, uh, Virgo and Beal. It puts together some ideas from uh, the free energy principle. So the fact that you need to have some uh, ways that an internal system does inference about an environment, and it puts together the relational uh, approach of random beer, but I'm trying to define this adaptive fit that I didn't see defined in, um, in beer's work. Adaptive fit to me will just be a way in which um, a system can maintain its homeostasis, at least to begin with. This is work in progress. I might have to add things over time, but for now, it's just you know a very simple uh, way to do homeostasis. The cool thing is that there is a nice theory in control. Uh, there is a nice framework in control theory to quantify homeostasis that tell us how a system that maintains homeostasis with this environment actually you know, embodies a model of that environment. And that model is basically acting as a higher order interaction between say the inner parts of a system and the outside world. So if you remember the free energy principle, agent, Marco Blanket, environment, this system is doing something similar, but I guess on a more general, this framework is doing something similar, but on, on a more general set of assumptions. Again, work in progress. So if there is a map between brain and environment, while brain and environment are both physically connected to the body, we have a proto agent. I don't think this is an agent yet, but I think I can add more stuff until I get something that is maybe an agent. So very general, it generalizes a lot of different things that I presented so far, not everything. I'm not so interested in causality personally, um, for example. Um, I'm not sure this works just for agents. It might work for something else. By the way, I'm done. Uh, yeah, so that's in case you, we are getting worried. Uh, yeah, no real causality. I think I'm fine with that. And if you want to look at it like from a different perspective, I'm only focusing on real environments, taking from Randa Bia's work, Virgo and uh, Beal that have this general model that could work with anything, just not just about being a model of the environment. Um, that might be a limitation. I don't know. I'm happy to think about physical agents for now. Um, okay, so a few assumptions. Uh, agency is relational. This is great. I think this is great. Maybe this is too general. Maybe, you know, we are not really saying much practical. Well, maybe we want causality. Maybe, you know, we are not really capturing agency, but something a bit more general. Again, like, you know, a lot of maybes. Concluding remarks. This is just the summary, like the three main mantras that I presented about prediction, causality, and relational methods. Take on message, like in case you want to remember um, what I was mentioning. And now, you know, I leave it to you.
what does your definition of agency need to include? Do you want to define agency? Thank you. So I want to talk about the detail of the, 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 the last, last one in the, in the talk next week. No. No. Uh, Still working. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, so there are a few ways to answer to that. Uh, it is work in progress. I mean, I think I have a, a milestone that I could present. Um, it is honestly the first time that I'm trying like, to, to write a paper uh, with category theory. And uh, it is a very different way to write and also a very different way to present. So usually say when you see a talk, especially <clears throat> that contains some maths, could be physics or something, there is a very short definition and then lots of results. And then you look at this result and another result and another result, and this is amazing. For a talk of things like this, I need to spend 80% of the time just on the definition, just to make sure that the definition is well understood, 80, 90%. And then the results are like one slide. So it looks like, oh, this is obvious. Yeah, because I spent 50 minutes just explaining why this is obvious. <laughs> so it's a very different way of, and I'm still not uh, comfortable, I guess, like going with that. Because yeah, now I'm writing this paper, like the result is like half a page, uh, but then I have 25 pages of just, you know, how to get to that result. But yeah, I might, um, maybe we can have some informal conversation about this. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Still, that helps me more, more, uh, more, more in lecture. So, uh, in the afternoon, we will start uh, 1 p.m. Then we will see you. See you.